So yeah, again, my name is Dustin Johnson. I'm the Rangeland Outreach Specialist with Oregon State University, and I do that work based out of the Eastern Oregon Agricultural Research Center um, in Burns. And so, you know, I'd much rather be uh, at a meeting face to face here and, and talking with you folks. This is, seems kind of weird to me to do it this way in a virtual format, but it's it's good that we kind of have this option uh, when we need it. And I really have to commend Jacob for organizing this meeting and uh, this virtual meeting. And I appreciate him asking me to come in and, and talk to all you folks. So um, I'm, I'm open to, you know, as I go through this, uh, what I have planned to talk about, I'm open to uh, folks just um, speaking up. And if you have questions or like, like Jacob mentioned, you, you can use the chat. So uh, please feel free to do that. Um, so during my time with all of you this evening, I, I would like to provide um, basically a summary of rangeland forage and fuels conditions that we're sort of anticipating um, for, you know, this upcoming grazing and fire season based on kind of what we know now. And I'll, there's going to obviously be some caveats associated with that, and I'll talk about those. But um, and probably more importantly, I'd like to cover some of the information sources um, and, and the methods that I used uh, for my assessment that I'm going to talk about. And, and I think that's important because uh, maybe you folks can use those same tools uh, in the future if, if you're interested or, or you think they might be useful. And then what I'll do is I'll wrap up and talk a little bit about the, the potential implications of projected forage and fuels conditions for this upcoming season. So um, it really shouldn't come as any surprise to, uh, to anybody that's spent much time in Eastern Oregon, but the, the weather in this part of the world is just darn variable. And that variability adds a lot of challenge to uh, the management of rangelands, particularly when we consider managing things like forage and fuels that you know, tend to be pretty highly responsive to the timing and the amount of precipitation that's received during any given year. And so sort of as an example of this, um, shown in this graph are crop or water year precipitation amounts that have been uh, recorded over the last nearly 80 years at the Northern Great Basin Experimental Range. And for those of you who aren't familiar with our experimental range that we work on out of Burns at the EOARC, it's uh, located on Highway 20 between Bend and Burns. Uh, it's near a little little place called Riley, Oregon, if you know where that's at. And so this sort of shotgun weather pattern or precipitation pattern that we see in this graph is, I would argue, is, is probably not unique to our experimental range. Um, in fact, after looking at more weather data than I would like to admit over the last uh, few, few days, few weeks, uh, getting ready for this and another talk that I was asked to do, I would say that this amount of precipitation variability is fairly characteristic of most of Eastern Oregon. I think I'd see some heads nodding if we were in the same room. So if we actually take a closer look at this graph, we see that our experimental range receives uh, crop year precipitation amounts falling within plus or minus 10% of the long-term average, which is represented by those orange dashed lines on the graph. So it receives precipitation kind of falling within that range less than 25% of the time. So you might say that uh, a normal precipitation year is actually kind of a statistical anomaly. And so you have to really ask yourself based on that, um, do the terms normal or average even apply when we're talking about this kind of variability? And this extreme variability in precipitation that we just looked at in the graph there, has uh, found implications for you know annual productivity, and of course the management of rangelands. And I'm sure you've all noticed this if you spent much time on rangeland. But the same rangeland site or the area, same area of rangeland can look completely different from one year to the next, depending on how much precipitation is received. And as an example here, I have a couple of photos I want to share with you and. Um, so these photos were taken of the same uh, area of rangeland, the same site, and at approximately the same time of year in early June, uh, but just in different years. And so in this case, 
Um, you know, the soils haven't really changed uh, over that, that time frame, about six years. Um, and, you know, I'm pretty familiar with this area. The management in terms of grazing or any other management hasn't changed. Um, nothing's really changed um, in this scenario except uh, for the amount of precipitation that was received. And so not only was the total amount of precipitation higher in 2018 in the photo on the right there, uh, but the timing of that precipitation was also very favorable for rangeland production compared to 2012, with uh, much higher amounts of uh, precipitation being received during those, you know, those critical months of, or at least in our part of the world, uh, May and June um, in 2018. So one of the, you know a question comes up. It's like how do how what does this extreme variability in precipitation and other weather factors mean for grazing and fuels management? And so we're we're not the first ones to be asking these kinds of questions. In fact, there was some early work in the 1960s that was subsequently uh, updated and refined in the mid 1980s by uh, a scientist by the name of Forrest Sneva. I uh, worked at the Eastern Oregon Ag Research Center. Um, and that work included modeling and forecasting range uh, forage production based on the amount of crop year precipitation that was received during a given year. And in this case, uh, the scientists that worked on this effort defined crop year precipitation as the amount of moisture received from September through June, which is a little different than how we normally think about crop year, but that's that's what they, what they, how they defined it in, in this work. And, you know, their research really demonstrated that a deviation or a change in crop year precipitation from the long-term median amount of precipitation either decreased or increased range production by a, a fairly predictable amount, you know, with a pretty tight relationship, as you can see on this graph. And the data are from uh, a pretty large and diverse um, geography as well from a lot of different sites. Um, so that relationship kind of holds up over, over a, you know, a pretty large area. And so I don't want to get into the nitty gritty of the model they developed, but I did want to touch on it um, because I used their model to try to better understand, you know, that the implications of, you know, this variability and precipitation that we discussed earlier. And I have that graph shown again here uh, demonstrating that, but implications of, of this variability for factors like forage and, and fuels production. And so as it, as it turned out, you know, we do a lot of research on our experimental range. So I actually had some forage production data from a site, you know, within a couple hundred yards of our long-term weather station where that basically recorded the data that we're, I was showing in that graph. And I was able to use um, that production information and the precipitation data from, from the weather station within the forage forecast model develop, developed by uh, SNEVA to uh, basically investigate the implications of, you know, some fairly, some highly variable precipitation on, on forage production. And this is a picture of the site that I, that I was sampling. And so it's a a fairly typical sagebrush bunchgrass plant community um, that we we might find in on a sagebrush rangeland. And so I'll kind of jump right into the results, some of my results here. And so shown in this graph are um, actually cow days per acre that the air, this area, you know, that rangeland site would support over the years, you know, for which we had precipitation records. And as you can see, and probably not real surprisingly, the variability in forage production and, and therefore the amount of grazing this rangeland can support is also highly variable. And what may be a little surprising is there can be nearly a six fold difference in how many cow days per acre this rangeland can support depending on the amount of precipitation that is received um, you know, in a given year. And so this rangeland can support, you know, um, upwards of 12 cow days per acre. And there are some years, depending on the amount of precipitation, it you know, supports less than two, which is a pretty striking difference. But when, when we're managing something like grazing on these kinds of rangelands, what we often do is we uh, stock for average conditions. And 
Uh, we typically don't do that rigidly. We, we kind of use that as a starting point and then we adjust um, based on forage availability um, uh, over time. But um, so I, but I was curious um, if we actually did, did that, we stocked for average conditions, average forage production conditions, and we didn't vary our stocking levels according to the forage that was actually available you know, on a given, on a year to year basis with that variability, what would our predicted forage utilization levels be? And so, so the assumption I used for this analysis was that we are stocking our rangeland to achieve 50% utilization of available forage, which is basically moderate use um, that is produced during, again, an average precipitation year. And as you can see from the graph, there are some years that the rangeland simply does not produce enough forage to supply, you know, a stocking level that is set for average conditions. And in other years, utiliza utilization falls well below our target level of 50%. In fact, by stocking for average conditions, you know, we get within plus or minus 10% of our target utilization between 40 and 60% utilization in less than half the year shown in the graph. So we all know in reality, um, we don't actually rigidly stock rangeland for average production conditions. And what we tend to do is we make adjustments based on you know, forage supply uh, during a given year or during a given time frame. So based on that, I, I wondered what would it look like if we fully adjusted our stocking rate to perfectly match the variability in forage supply <clears throat> in order to achieve a target utilization level of 50% on a year to year basis. And as you can see on the graph, um, some year to year adjustments would require over 200% reduction or expansion in the herd. And on average, if you look at this over, over the entire data set, you would need to adjust your herd size by about 44% each year to perfectly match you know, that variable forage um, supply. So, you know, and that's, that's really not something that many, if any, producers can actually do, um, especially uh, cow-calf producers that tend to not have a lot of um, flexibility in their, their actual numbers. And, you know, that's kind of what we do largely here in Eastern Oregon. <clears throat> so really the, you know, one of, one of the questions becomes, uh, how can we reasonably, what can we reasonably do to deal with this extreme variability when, managing something like grazing or when managing something like fuels in, in fire prone environments like Eastern Oregon. So I'm not gonna um, profess that I, I have all the answers to this. This is, this is difficult. Uh, it's difficult to manage in such a variable production environment, but part of the answer here might be um, having earlier knowledge of, of things like forage availability and, and fuels production. And so being able to forecast forage and fuels conditions earlier in the season would provide more time to identify things like alternative grazing or forage options or to strategize adjustments in grazing rotations, you know, during those years, kind of those more drought years uh, where we see uh, lower rangeland production or um, to strategically graze certain areas to achieve uh, fuels or other management objectives during those high production years. And as it turns out, there are a number of tools and information sources that are either coming online or already available, and I'll talk about some of those actually, that I think could be useful for doing this kind of thing. And one of those tools is actually the climate engine. <clears throat> and you can use this tool to access basically near real-time gridded precipitation and other weather and atmospheric information that gets above my head pretty quick. But the biggest thing is we can look at precipitation information using this tool. And so one of the products available through this, uh, through this tool or this service is a gridded precipitation data set that's available from 1979 through, through present that covers uh, basically the United States. Um, so it's a pretty, pretty uh, amazing data set in my mind. And so I have a screenshot pulled up here um, from, from the website that shows the precipitation amounts from the 2019 water year as an, as an example. And so the color uh, ramp on, in this map indicates the amount of precipitation 
that was re received during that 2019 water year. And the, the yellow uh, tones on the map indicate areas receiving lower amounts of precipitation, basically the west. And the blue tones um, indicate areas that receive uh, higher precipitation amounts, which is essentially the eastern US and the western coast. And so you can, you can actually view the, the information or the data um, using the mapping interface on the website there. You can zoom in and out to areas of, of interest and, and look at the data. Or even better from my perspective, you can download the information for areas that you define. And I have an example of that on the screenshot there uh, of an area that I defined. Um, for you can do that for predefined date ranges like various water years or there's very a lot of options you can select from in there or you can actually customize date ranges for time frames that you're particularly interested in and so once you download the data you can actually bring them into a, a geographic information system um, or a GIS and use them for a variety of things. In our case, I, I use them to model forage production on Eastern Oregon rangelands using um, the forage forecasting model uh, that Sneva worked on that I talked about earlier. And so I'm gonna jump into some of the results of, of what I did. And so shown here are projected rangeland forage uh, yields for 2020. And and the, the information is expressed as the uh, sort of the expected difference from normal forage production levels. And I, I struggled a little bit trying to decide on the best mapping unit for uh, displaying this information. And what I ended up settling on are the Rangeland Fire Protection Association or RFPA boundaries. And I'm hoping you're all somewhat familiar with those. Um, and I did this partially because I'll be talking about fuels conditions um, a little later on and I just wanted to be consistent and again I, I really hope that you're somewhat familiar with these RFPAs are a really important component to uh, to uh, dealing with wildfire issues uh, in eastern Oregon. So on the map um, the RFPAs shaded in green are projected to have near normal to, or to slightly below normal rangeland forage production um, kind of in the northern part of the northeastern part of the state and um, the majority of the RFPA areas shaded in yellow are projected to have about 10 to 20 percent below normal production um, this upcoming season. And the RFPA areas in the kind of the north central uh, part of the part of Oregon are expected to have well below normal rangeland forage production levels um, in, 20, in 2020. Now with all that said I we do need to interpret these projections with a little bit of a grain of salt. Um, as you might uh, remember when I talked about the forage forecast model earlier, it actually uses September through June precipitation amounts uh, to predict uh, forage yields. And obviously, uh, you know, we're most of the way through May here, but you know, June hasn't happened. Um, so what I ended up doing is I used the long-term median precipitation amounts for May and June to develop the, the predictions in the model. And so in other words, a lot of this could actually change if we, if we have either extremely wet or dry uh, months in, in May and June. And, June, June. and so I know uh, where I'm at in Burns here, we actually have received some moisture recently, which has been very helpful. And I think that's been fairly widespread throughout the state. state. So, a lot of this may, may adjust. But I was curious about that. So I um, looked at the latest sort of three month outlook from the National Weather Service uh, Climate Prediction Center. And you know, the latest three month out, outlook indicates uh, sort of a higher prior probability of warmer temperatures and lower precipitation amounts than we would normally expect for May, June and July, unfortunately. And so therefore the forage predictions that I, I just talked about on my last slide may be slightly optimistic, but we'll see how, how things kind of pan out as, as we go through the year. So now I'd like to take, kind of switch gears just a little bit and take a few minutes and talk about another um, potentially useful tool for predicting fuels and forage conditions. 
And this tool is called uh, FuelCast. And Jordan, I wonder if, some, if this could actually play into some of what you're talking about, trying to get a handle on, on biomass. We'll see here. Maybe we'll talk later. But, but the, this tool, FuelCast, was developed by Matt Reeves and some of his colleagues out of the Rocky Mountain Research Center in Montana. And so fuel, FuelCast is a model that predicts rangeland production, also predicts uh, production of annual plants, which in our part of the world is uh, in Eastern Oregon are primarily annual grasses like cheatgrass, medusa head, and increasingly some others like bentonata uh, that are fairly scary. Um, and it also importantly predicts date of peak production. I'll talk about why I think that's important in a minute here. But so the tool also allows you to compare the projected production level uh, and or dates with the long with long term averages to see kind of how the predicted values sort of stack up against you know the long term normals or what we might normally expect. And you can view this information using the mapping interface. That I have a screenshot pulled up of, of an example of that. Um, I encourage you to do it, to go to the FuelCastNet website. It's, it's pretty cool and um, you can waste a lot of time uh, playing around with it, believe me. Um, or you can download the data uh, for analysis again in a GIS and that's, that's basically what I did. And I wanna talk about um, kind of what I found by doing that here. So again, um, the production information from FuelCast is, I think it's extremely useful. Um, but I've already talked about some of those predictions based on some of the modeling that I did, um, again, with some big caveats there. But so what I wanted to really focus on here were, are the projected dates of peak rangeland production from the fuel cast model. And I, I think this sort of information is extremely useful um, because it can be used to predict when fuel production levels are peaking, uh, for one, and consequently, also, when fuel moisture levels, and if you're talking about from a grazing standpoint, when fuel forage quality levels can be expected to rapidly decline. You know, we, we primarily have cool season uh, rangeland here, and so that, that timing of peak production is pretty well tied to when we start to see those fine fuels uh, dry down pretty rapidly, and, and all associated with that when forage quality tends to decline rapidly as well. And so um, for this map here that I'm showing, I, I, again, I use the RFPA boundaries to present you know, the information. And based on the fuel cast project projections, the RFPA areas shaded in yellow um, can expect near normal timing of peak production. The area in, shaded in red, which is the Brothers Hampton RFPA, uh, can expect earlier than normal peak production, you know, upward, upwards uh, of two weeks. And the green shaded RFPAs can anticipate later than normal peak production. And I'll touch on this again just in a, in a minute here, why I think this is important. Okay, before I do that though, I, I, I wanted to shift over to talking more specifically about fuels for just a little bit here. And so the first thing I'd like to mention is I think a lot of us understand that understand this that have been around uh, fuels and wildfire and that sort of thing, but it's usually the previous year's range production that sets us up to have a big wildfire season, especially when we get a big production year followed by a more of a drought year or a warm dry year. And so for an example on this map I'm showing the 2011 rangeland production estimates for Eastern Oregon and those of us that remember 2011, it was a, it was a pretty productive year. We, we actually had a lot of moisture that year. And so on this map, the brown tones on the map indicate lower than normal range production, while the yellow and green tones show greater than normal um, production estimates. And so again, rangeland production was extremely high in 2011, especially in the southeastern part of the state where I'm located. And so also shown on this map uh, with the black polygons or outlines are the are fire boundaries from the 2012 uh, fire season. And the biggest fires, uh, Miller Homestead and Holloway and Long Draw fires, uh, occurred in you know, areas of extreme range production compared to normal in those really green, green areas on the map. 
And so on this map, I, I have the same 2012 fire boundaries, in this case, overlaying uh, the 2012 yield estimates uh, based on the modeling that I did. And here again, the, the brown tones indicate lower than normal production. And the, the yellow and green tones, in this case, indicate normal to slightly above normal production. And so 2012 was obviously a, a much less productive year, especially in Southeast Oregon where these, these big fires occurred. And so again, we had an extremely productive year in 2011, followed by a very dry, kind of drought-like year in 2012 which uh, really set us up to have these big wildfires um, in Southeast Oregon. Okay, so I, I've hammered you over the head with a lot of maps here, and this is the, that actually the last one that I'm gonna show you or subject you to. Um, so uh, what I'm showing here on this map are the 2019 yield estimates. And I have, again, the RFPA boundaries as an overlay to sort of orient you to, you know, the patterns in, in range production from 2019. And although maybe slightly shifted to the north in the state, what we see here is a very similar pattern of range production that, that we observed in 2012, again, before the year before these, these big wildfires in the Miller Homestead, Long Drawn, Holloway fires. And in addition, you know, it really looks like this year will offer more drought-like conditions. Uh, hopefully this rain and cool weather that we're getting continues, but, um, but it looks like it's gonna shape up to be more of a drought year, similar to what we experienced in 2012 during the year of these big fires. And so based on how conditions are kind of shaping up for this year, it really seems like the, the table could be set for a big wildfire season, you know, especially in central and southeast Oregon. Now, I do wanna, wanna say here, I'm not saying we're gonna have a big wildfire season, um, but from strictly from a fuel standpoint, uh, it looks like really the table could be set uh, for a big wildfire year. And so, okay, I'm gonna end with just some, some uh, concluding thoughts here. And so the first one is uh, managing grazing and fuels in an extremely production environment, extremely variable production environment, is really not rocket science. As it turns out, it's actually much harder than that. You know, dealing with this amount of variability from in production and in terms of fuels and forage production from year to year, you know, it's tough to respond to that. Um, but I think that having information earlier, you know, being able to predict how things are shaping up in terms of the grazing and fire seasons, you know, that's better. It allows more time for maybe some contingency planning. And I think there's uh, several new tools and information sources. Um, I talked about some of those that are creating opportunities. And I use some of those to um, develop kind of an outlook uh, for the upcoming grazing and fire seasons. And it really looks like, you know, in gen general, rangeland production will be lower this year based on th how things are shaping up. Um, kind of on the bright side, though, the timing of peak production uh, will generally be normal or later than normal. Um, the later we can push that, the, the more we can compress that wildfire season. And I, I think that's, uh, that could be a really good thing, could be very helpful this year. And again, you know, with a lot of caveats here, um, the table could be set for a big wildfire year. You know, we kind of have the production scenario from 2019, and perhaps we're kind of facing a warm, dry year this year. And um, so I, I, from at least from a fuel standpoint, we might be set up to have a, a big wildfire year, especially in South Central and, and Southeastern Oregon. So that is what I had to talk about. So I'd be happy to take any questions or, or comments if folks have them.